are just excited by the future. It will be shaped by those who are young and inspired enough to do something today. My name is Tomorrow, though you'll never see my face. I'm the future of your children who one day will take your place. To be a rocketeer is to have a dream. This is a nightmare. Once something has gone wrong, the most important thing is to find out what went wrong and why. One big problem is that it all happens in a fraction of a second. And the first step is to talk it over and get everybody's account of the failure. All theories have to be tested. Then we go back to the drawings and plans before we can even start thinking about a next shot. We try to do most of the building of the rockets ourselves, and we've acquired quite a few skills in the process. Using a microscope, a thin piece of aluminum foil is scratched so that it can be used for a fuel valve diaphragm. The slight scratch will make it burst in a controlled way at a certain pressure, letting the propellant through to the combustion chamber. This is a liquid propellant rocket, and it takes ages to get it in shape for launching. So, in the meantime, we console ourselves with smaller ones, solid motor rockets. The real reason, of course, is to perfect the control of the three stages. Oh, no. Well, they are supposed to separate, but not like this. But there's something to learn from every mistake. The design of the stabilization fins and the body as a whole can be tested for its aerodynamic qualities in a wind tunnel using a miniature dummy. Thank God, at least one thing works. This is what it's supposed to look like, only high in the sky. Now, just one more try with a solid rocket motor and a static test bench, just to practice the procedure. Well, just you wait.
Flip a coin, said Pascal. That's a 17th century French mathematician. And you'll have one chance of it turning heads up and one of tails. Flip two coins, and there's one way in which they can both be heads. Two ways of one of each, heads, tails, and tails, heads, then back to one chance of both tails. Three coins give one possibility of all heads. Three combinations of one head and two tails. One, two, three. Another three combinations of one tail and two heads. One, two, three. And then back to one way of getting all tails. Carry on to four coins, and there's still only one way of getting all heads. Then there's four combinations of one head and three tails. One, two, three, four. Six possibilities of two of each. One, two, three, four, five, six. Back to four sets of one tails and three heads. One, two, three, four. Four. And finally, there remains only one chance of all tails. This gambler's manual is, in fact, a complex mathematical structure called Pascal's Triangle, and it contains many interesting features. For instance, if you add two figures next to each other in one row, they add up to the figure diagonally below them. This means that you could build this whole triangle just using figures without flipping one single coin. Interesting enough for a 17th century guy. But I'm Richard, and I'm 12 years old. In the 20th century, mathematics are my hobby, and I have an idea of how to elaborate the old man's formula. How, says Dad, who has to wrestle with all my new ideas. Well, my calculations show that I could make it into a three-dimensional figure, a pyramid, and keep the mathematical interrelation intact. To prove it, I built a pyramid out of 220 numbered wooden balls. Instead of two-sided coins, I used three colored spinning tops. Each level in the pyramid corresponds to the rows of figures in the triangle, and the number of every ball refers to the number of possible outcomes of a certain color combination. The more spinning tops, the wider the base of the pyramid, and you can easily watch how the figures add up, just like in the triangle. Six plus three plus three equals 12. No one else has ever written anything about this, so I wanted to call it Richard's Pyramid, but Dad's for modesty, so okay, Pascal's Pyramid. 